Hello, Caroline Mitchell here. I'm an ex-police detective and crime thriller author, and this week I'll be discussing one of the most talked about people over the last two years, Chris Watts. I'll be giving you my thoughts on the case as well as the latest updates, so stay tuned for more. I wasn't going to cover this case because it's been very well documented already and I do prefer to cover both known and unknown crimes but this is one of my most requested cases so here we go. If you'd like to skip the intro I'll put some timestamps in the box below. So we go to Frederick in Colorado just north of Denver and has a population of over 12,000 people and most people who live there own their own homes and it's a nice area with parks, concerts and good schools. It has a low crime rate and is listed as one of the best places to live in Colorado. Shanann wasn't on the lookout for a serious relationship, having been recently divorced. Chris was known as an introvert, while Shanann had a bright and bubbly personality. The couple dated for just two years before they married and the wedding was a big celebration, with family and friends saying what a great couple they were. In 2013, they bought their new five-bedroom home in Frederick, Colorado. In December of that year, their first child, Bella, was born. And on the 17th of July in 2015, Shannon gave birth to their second daughter, Celeste C.C. Watts. And in the same year, Chris and Shannon declared bankruptcy. At that point, it said they had a combined income of $90,000, but they were struggling due to credit card debt, student loans and medical bills and their mortgage and car payments took up most of their monthly expenses and this was not a cheap neighbourhood to live in. In 2018, Chris had a steady job in Anadarko Petroleum while Shanann was working from home in a multi-level marketing company called Lavelle, selling a health product called Thrive. So an MLM as it's called, you not only sell a product, you recruit people to sell it too and while guiding them through the process, you take a percentage of their sales. And Shanann was good at her job, connecting with her clients through social media and she spent a lot of her time there. Chris would sometimes reluctantly appear on the camera uh, and on the live feeds as well as her children, Cece and Bella. And Shanann was constantly saying how blessed she was. Do you want to count in Spanish? Yeah. Go ahead, count. You know? Dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. Good job. That's awesome. All right, will you say goodbye to everybody? Bye. Cece's eating all the food in our kitchen. That's true. Cece, see? There she is. Say no? Hi. You want to say hi? Say hi. <laughs> no? Okay. That's Cece. Fun CC. All right, guys, seriousness now. If you want to try cafe, let me know. Sarah, I have some for you. Um, and Dan. So um, I'll get you some next time I see you. Shanann was a natural in front of the camera and portrayed the image of being in a happy, loving family. Chris was a lot quieter than Shanann and he appeared though to care deeply for his wife and children. And he was also into health and fitness and he'd lost a lot of weight since meeting Shanann and really toned up. In May 2018, Shanann found out that she was pregnant and told Chris while recording him live on Facebook. But Chris seemed really taken aback by it all and Shanann was excited wearing a cute t-shirt saying, oops, I did it again. But the whole thing seemed kind of deflated and weird as far as Chris was concerned. But the baby had been his idea, according to what Shanann told her friends. <laughs> I like that shirt. Really? Really. That's awesome. So pink means... That's just the test. I know. It just says the pink is going to be girls? I don't know. Just the test. That's awesome. Guess, guess, guess when you want to, it happens. The following month, Shanann took her children on a six week holiday to see her family, but it was apparent that things were problematic in the relationship. Shanann told her friends that Chris seemed to have lost interest in her, and it was during this time that Chris was getting together with his co worker, Nicole. 
Chris often missed calls from his wife and really gave her the cold shoulder while Shanann told her friends that Chris preferred working out to talking to her. Because the truth was, he just wasn't interested, not in his wife, not in his kids, and certainly not in her pregnancy. After Shanann returned home with the kids, she worked hard to repair her marriage, but it seemed very one-sided. On the 14th of July, Chris told Shanann that he wanted to separate and that he didn't want the baby after all. Now, Shanann did not go, want to go down that road. I mean, she had two small children with one on the way and she liked living in Colorado and she loved the lifestyle that she worked so hard to build. She wanted to do right by her children and bring them up in a two-parent household. But most of all, she loved her husband and she wanted to fight for their marriage. They'd only been married for a few years. But Chris was sharing nude pictures with his mistress, Nicole, and saving them on an app on his phone. And this app actually looked like a calculator, but was used for sharing online photos and files when you typed in the right code. Chris bought Nicole out for meals, and while she was financially secure, he paid for everything, using vouchers that he got through work so it wouldn't show up on his credit card. Although once, Shanann did question a meal that showed up in their bank statement as it came to so much. And Chris made his excuses and denied any wrongdoing. Now, Nicole knew Chris was married and later said that he'd promised to leave his wife. Shanann was texting Chris saying how stressed she was trying to balance work, family and the pregnancy on her own and she pleaded with him to meet her halfway. But Chris was too busy dreaming of his other life that he had planned with Nicole. And it was this dream that would cost Shanann and her children their lives. Later, police would find his internet history to reveal searches such as how does it feel when someone says I love you and when to say I love you for the first time in a new relationship. And this gives a clue to his emotions and personality. I mean, if you have to consult Facebook to ask what love feels like, then something is missing. Police would also later discover that Nicole, his mistress, was looking up Shanann's Facebook page and searching things like marrying your mistress and wedding dresses online. Chris started sleeping in the basement of his home and it's said that Shanann kicked him out of the bed because he was behaving so coldly towards her. And I don't know if that's 100% true or not, but she did do her best to keep up the pretense of a happy home for the sake of her girls. Although some neighbours would later say they had arguing coming from the house. To be completely honest with you, my wife and I were kind of wondering when she was on vacation if something happened because I've heard them full out screaming at each other at the top of their lungs and he gets crazy. Does he? Um, and that's pretty recently? Yeah. I'm guessing that's why she went and visited people is because she wanted to get away from the situation. Shanann suffered from lupus for which she received treatment, but the stress of the situation was leaving her exhausted and drained. And she texted her friends to say that Chris said that he was scared to death of having a new baby, that he was happy with the two he had. She said he changed so quickly and she couldn't understand how he could go from being a loving husband to completely distant in the space of a few weeks. She wrote Chris a heartfelt letter and sent him a book on marriage therapy, which went in the bin. Now this is where things get weird, because on the 9th of August, Chris sent Shanann a photo of a large four foot doll with its face and body covered and its legs sticking out. And Shanann posted the picture on Facebook saying she wasn't quite sure how to respond to that. Shanann traveled around a lot for her job and was away at a work conference with her friend, also named Nicole. And while she was away, Chris was out seeing his mistress, the other Nicole, uh, while his neighbor babysat. And at 10 to 2 in the morning on the 13th of August, Shanann returned home from a business trip in Arizona after being driven home by her friend and colleague, Nicole Atkinson. And little did she know that this was the last time she would walk into her front door alive. Chris was said to be asleep, as were the girls, and Shanann had an ob When Shanann missed a business meeting later that morning, Nicole drove to her house to see her with her son. And it was about 10 past 12 when Nicole, Shanann's friend, turned up at the house. Now, Chris was at work, but he had been alerted by an app on his phone that someone was there. And he seemed unconcerned when Nicole spoke to him, telling her that Shanann had taken the kids on a play date. But Nicole pointed out that something wasn't right, as Shanann's car was still in the garage, as were the children's car seats. And she told Chris that she was calling the police. Chris told her to leave it. But, you know, being the good friend that she was, Nicole called the Frederick police. So worth noting that Chris's work colleague said he seemed to be acting perfectly normally that morning, although he'd parked his car in a different position than usual. And these are the things an officer would be looking at as well from the off. 
He seemed troubled but not hugely worried about his wife and children and he gave the police officer permission to search the house but there was no sign of Shanann or the girls. Now in a situation like this the officer would need permission as I've said to be allowed inside unless they had proper justification that someone was in danger for example if they saw someone lying on the ground. In the UK when we joined the police we swear allegiance to the crown and to protect life and limb but you need justification to enter someone's property and getting the homeowner's permission is the quickest way in. During this time officers are watching and police quickly ascertain that Shannon's purse phone and keys were still in the house and according to Chris he found her wedding ring on the master bed. It's obvious that he didn't expect the police to be involved so quickly. I think he underestimated Nicole in that respect and he needed more time to settle himself and you know I don't know if he had plans to go back and correct what he did that morning um, but he just didn't get the chance if he did and it's said that you know he wrote letters in prison saying he had no remorse at the time but it's clear he was terrified about getting arrested because he is so focused on what the police are going to do next and what they're doing that he's not thinking of how a normal husband and father should react but instead he keeps giving the police sneaky glances as he listens closely to them updating the police radio. He should also be looking at the security cameras of his home to see if there's been any comings or goings. When they go to the neighbor's house and he can see himself on CCTV loading up his truck he's barely able to contain his nervousness. Well. How far along? 14, 15 minutes. And Chris told the police that he had not seen his wife since he left for work at a quarter past five that morning. Journalists appeared and he was interviewed by several news channels and this was something he would later regret and again he was acting sketchy and you could tell that journalists were thinking the same thing as they zoomed in on his face when they asked him about his children. Cadaver and search dogs were brought to his property and there were some alerts but nothing hugely substantial and the officers commented on how clean the place smelled and of how the sheets had been stripped from the bed and then the officers found pillowcases and a top bed sheet in the kitchen rubbish bin next to the kitchen island and they knew something was up. Officer Perez later said that while speaking with Chris he showed no emotion and did not seem to respond appropriately to the situation. Chris didn't ask any questions or offer to help at any time and his facial expressions rarely changed. However, when they did, he seemed to smile or smirk inappropriately, displaying a lack of empathy, specifically when speaking about his children. His voice remained low and even toned and his nonverbal cues were also very apparent. Police also reported that Chris had a tense posture, his arms were crossed the majority of the time, he lacked eye contact and he appeared to be nervous looking around constantly. The FBI and the Colorado Bureau of Investigation joined the next day. Another one of the police officers said that uh, once I made contact with Christopher he did not ask me if I'd been calling because I had any information concerning his missing wife and daughters or if I was calling because they'd been found. They also discovered that Chris had deleted his Facebook page before his family died. After Shanann's disappearance, her mother told officers that she and her husband believed that her daughter and granddaughter's disappearance involved foul play and she believed that her son-in-law was involved in the disappearance. She stated that Christopher was acting weird and out of the ordinary. She said he was telling people that he had to go to work and that didn't seem right and she felt that he was going out to pour oil on the bodies to dispose of them somewhere. One anonymous psychic actually said that the incident happened between 2 and 5 a.m. that Shannon was strangled and that her daughter suffocated and there was no bloodshed. And then they said that they were moved by truck to a wooded area nearby, that there was a feeling of being underwater and that they had a vision of each girl being wrapped up in a blanket after death. And you know they got a couple of details wrong but that's a pretty chilling vision don't you think? Now I've seen all sorts of wild theories online. I've watched uh, some videos which stated that Nicole, Chris's mistress, actually helped him load their bodies into the truck. 
And they managed to pull out this really blurry pixelated image which they claimed was of a ponytail, but I didn't see anything. Because I don't believe she was involved. And you know how I know that Chris didn't have help that day? Because had a second person been involved, they would have handled it way better than he did. I mean, it's hard to believe just how badly he handled it. The GPS coordinates on his truck brought officers to the exact location of the burial site where he worked. He did have several long conversations with Nicole, his mistress, sometime after the crime. And it's highly possible that maybe he did confess it after it happened. But had the police been able to prove Nicole Kissinger's involvement, then she would have been prosecuted for helping him cover it up. So while her behaviour was maybe inappropriate, I don't believe she was involved. So what about the police interview? Well, Chris was brought to the police station and he agreed to a voluntary interview. And in the UK, these are commonplace. There's no arrests made, but the person involved is cautioned and told they are entitled to a lawyer. And I'm surprised that he didn't take legal advice given the seriousness of the case. But a lot of people don't because they're scared it'll make them look guilty. And I imagine Chris thought that if he continued with his story that he hadn't seen his wife or children, that everything would be okay. And over here, you only need suspicion of involvement in a crime to arrest someone, which is why we say I'm arresting you on suspicion of and so forth. But people are more likely to talk in a more informal setting. And here in the UK, if anyone confesses to a crime during an informal interview, you then have to pause everything, place them under arrest, reiterate the caution and then progress. And of course, give them the opportunity to have legal um, representation. I loved interviewing when I was in the police and I went through different tiers of training to improve. I've worked in several different departments over the years, but when I left, I was part of DAS and that's the Domestic Abuse Safeguarding Team. Team, and we worked really hard to protect victims of stalkers too. We took a multi-agency approach helping to safeguard victims of the highest risk and on average two women a week die at the hands of their partners or former partners in the UK and in the US it's three a day and it's worth noting that in the majority of cases victims are at the highest risk when the relationship is coming to an end. Chris Watts interviewers were experts in their field. They used very clever interview techniques to get Chris to confess. And remember, Chris agreed to be interviewed because saying no would make him look bad. And they used the same reasoning with the polygraph test. He agreed to the test, but he failed. And they returned to the interview after hours of interrogation. All the evidence was coming together. They had his phone, access to his home, his truck, GPS coordinates, and of course, all the communications between Shanann and her friends about his reluctance to have the baby and the state of their marriage. They also had proof that Chris was lying as Nicole, his mistress, came forward after details of their affair emerged on his phone. But they needed to hear it from Chris himself before he closed down and asked for a lawyer. Now, I've spoken to the underbelly of society when I was in the police, and it's all about how they justify their crimes. Even with someone like Chris, who lacked empathy for his wife and children. When officers are putting the pressure on, he cares about what people are thinking about him. It's too big a leap to confess of disposing of his wife and daughters in the most horrific way. And he doesn't want people to think that he's a monster because in his mind, he has justified his actions. As the officer in the interview said, he had a shiny new life all lined up for himself and all he had to do was dispose of the old one. And he couldn't just get a divorce because in his head, he couldn't afford it. He had a big life insurance policy out on his family. And, you know, to him, the kids couldn't live without their mom and it was the best way out. Marital amnesia was all he wanted, just to forget everything and start again. But in the cold light of day, he was forced to look into the mirror and see himself as a monster he truly was. And that's when the interviewer gave him an out. Now, from what I can see, investigators use the Reed method, which is a nine point system of interviewing, sometimes used by police departments in the US. Now, we don't use it over here in the UK that I'm aware of, probably because it would be contested at court. But it is interesting to note um, the seventh step in which the investigator presents two choices to the suspect in interview. Basically, he did it or his wife did it. And this is where they assume their guilt with one uh, alternative offering a better justification for the crime for example as I said you know was it your wife who made you lose control and the investigator may follow the question with a supporting statement which encourages the suspect to choose the more understandable side of the alternative 
The female interviewers comment most chicks are crazy, right? Would discuss most right-minded people, but this would have been pre-planned. The seating plans, their questions, their responses. This was all a necessary evil because time was running out. Because she took them out of the house with their blankets and their animals. Except because he cared. That's why Carrie Dad does. I mean, I'm always caring for these kids. There's no, nothing in this, in this wolf. For my life. I believe that. I believe that. And I believe someone made a mistake, whether it was you, you or Shanann. And you either cleaned up after Shanann or you made the mistake. And I mean, I want to believe that maybe Shanann did it and you felt compelled to fix this so Shanann didn't look bad. That's what I that's what I want to believe. But I don't know, you're not telling me that, so it makes me think the worst. Like, did you I did not do all anything. three of them? I did like, not do anything with the kids. Not do anything. What did she need to do? Tell us, Chris. Chicks are crazy. Can I talk to my dad or something? <laughs> Help us not do this with you, okay? Will you tell us what you told your dad? The show of empathy was set up to make him comfortable enough to get him to tell the truth, which is why Chris Watts jumped on it. And, you know, he knew he was cornered, but blaming his wife for his daughter's murders helped him to move away from the harsh spotlight that he had been put under. He was a good guy, really. He just snapped. At least that's what he wanted to portray. His father was then called in to ease the passage of the confession. And the officers would have been in another room listening in. Now, when I was in the police, this wasn't really how we did things, but different departments have different protocols, and I'm glad that they were able to in this case. The presence of Chris's father helped him to confess, but officers would have been watching and listening. And the second Watt's father suggested a lawyer, this is when the officers stepped in. Now, please don't think this is devious because you've got to remember what this guy did. He could have let his family go. He could have divorced his wife. He could have even asked for help. Chris confessed to strangling his pregnant wife, saying that he had flown into a rage after she killed their children because she took the news of their separation badly, just as was suggested to him. But at least this way he could tell officers exactly where the bodies were, and now they had enough evidence to take it all the way. According to the investigators, at one point, Ronnie, Chris's dad, asked them to look at the photograph of the four-foot doll featured on uh, Shanann's Facebook page. Ronnie pointed out that the doll was completely covered with a sheet and he said, I'm thinking, he said, this might have been planned, I don't know. Ronnie said Shanann commented that uh, Bella had put the sheet on the doll, but he said he never saw Bella do anything like that. But it was all very strange. It's a bit like a warning, isn't it? Another bizarre part of the investigation that was revealed was that after the murder, Chris searched uh, Google for the lyrics to a song called Battery by Metallica. And it's 
he seems to have this connection with what he did. And indeed, the oil drums that he actually placed his children's bodies in are called batteries. And it makes you wonder if he found a weird connection to the words. Three months after blaming his wife for his children's deaths, Chris Watts admitted to smothering four-year-old Bella and three-year-old Celeste with a blanket. He claimed that he killed his wife after an argument, but you know, given the lack of evidence of a fight, I think she was asleep. And it's why officers photograph the suspect when they come in, in cases such as these, because they're looking for scratch marks, bruises, anything that could signal that the victim fought back. But Chris was a coward and he wanted the easiest way out. So why did he eventually admit to what he did? Was it because he felt guilty uh, letting Shanann take the blame? Or perhaps he was taking her family into consideration knowing the pain he had caused them? No. He pleaded guilty because it was part of a deal to avoid the death penalty. Once again, Chris was thinking of himself. You didn't just put the dog into your house. You let Chris into your house too. Yeah. After the fact of everything happened, um, you have a little girl that fell at Celeste's age. In hindsight, what's going through your mind? That regret. Regret. I mean, that's something I'll never forget. That we we allowed this guy in our house i mean had we had we had any inclination that we we thought he was involved at all no way would i have let him in my house with my wife and kid um so he slept right across the hall from her right i mean she came in that morning and we saw it was like i, I saw mr chris uh you know because i mean their doors are right by each other um um, and so that, I feel, I just, I'm never going to forget. It's just a haunting memory now at this point, like. <laughs> Chris's mistress was fully cooperative with the police, providing them with her phone so they could download the deleted texts, and there were quite a few. She recalled a conversation with Chris on the 13th of August when he told her that Shanann had left her wedding ring at the house. Chris asked her how much she thought the ring was worth, and she told him to pawn it and find out. It was later revealed that Nicole Kessinger spent four hours searching for news of Chris and Shanann online. Numerous calls went back and forth between them after the murders, and some of the calls are quite long. She also searched Can Cops Trace text messages online and for details of Amber Frey, her net worth and details of her book deal. Now, Amber Frey was the mistress of convicted murderer Scott Peterson, who was found later uh, guilty of killing his wife Lacey and his unborn child in 2002. And Frey was a key witness in this prosecution and later became a published author. On November the 14th in 2018, Christopher Watts was sentenced to five life sentences without the possibility of parole, three to be served consecutively and two to be served concurrently. According to FBI profilers, many of these types of crimes happen in August before school starts, which might delay discovery. And when I worked in the police, uh, most domestic incidents, and by this I mean fights now, not murders, they were usually reported at dinner time in the evening when everyone sat together at the table for the day. And holidays were also a very busy time, Christmas in particular, when families get together and alcohol flows. But with regards to Chris Ross, I do believe this was a premeditated murder. Shanann's family were interviewed on television and it was heartbreaking to watch. Her mother said that she felt her daughter's spirit on the night she died. She said she woke up the whole house and said that something was wrong with Shanann and that she felt the presence of her daughter telling her mother that she loved her and that she was at peace. And she also said she spoke to Bella who said she could go to Walt Disney World anytime she wanted. According to the Denver Post, lead Frederick police detective Dave Baumhover had suffered from PTSD since the case, likening it to a bad fairground ride that he couldn't get off. Colorado Bureau investigator agent Tammy Lee uh, told the Denver Post that once she broke down in the hairdresser's sobbing because she felt like she knew the family. I've watched Shanann's Facebook videos and she had a lovely way of bringing you into her family, of talking directly to the camera in a way that it felt like she was your friend. And as a woman who works hard to support her children, I certainly felt a connection to her. And it's hard to comprehend, you know, what would happen when you're watching the family online. And Chris's parents, Cindy and Ronnie, tried to collect the life insurance money, which basically became available because their son murdered his family. But Chris left it in Shanann's estate. Both Shanann's parents and Chris's parents went to court to fight for the money. And in the end, the money was given to lawyers to distribute. But where it went wasn't a matter of public record and neither family has commented on it. 
Shanann's parents won a civil wrongful death lawsuit against Chris Watts to the tune of six million dollars as well, although it's unlikely they'll see it given Chris is spending the rest of his life in prison. Um, the bank foreclosed on the Watts family home and it was valued at $645,000, but they were, you know, to date they've been unable to sell it. I mean, who'd want to live in such a home? And even if you bought it at a heavily discounted price, it's unlikely they'd ever be able to sell it again. So what happened to Nicole Kessinger? Well, as you can imagine, she received a huge amount of hatred and abuse. According to allthatsinteresting.com, it said she started a new job and is in witness protection. Now, she was an independent, intelligent woman who graduated from the Colorado State University in 2013 with a Bachelor of Science. And she also had an Associate of Science. So there's no hard evidence to suggest that Nicole knew of Chris's plans. And I'm sure she would advise them to get legal advice at the very least if she did. Nicole Kessinger turned out to have information that I can best describe as being a bombshell, said County District Attorney Michael Rourke. But there were other women who did know what Chris did and said they didn't care. They said they loved him regardless. One of them even told him uh, about their own daughter, while at the same time saying that she didn't care what he did because she loved him so much. But none of these women have ever met Chris Watts. And this was some of the fan mail he received in jail. Now this kind of behavior has got a name, it's called hypostophilia, and I have spoken about it in previous true crime episodes. But there are other people too who contacted Chris with a view to getting more information from him. But you know, I don't want to talk about them and I don't want to talk about Chris's supporters or the people who so viciously victim blamed Shanann and her family. They have been through enough and my heart goes out to them. But there is one person and one person only responsible for the destruction of that family and that is the man who is meant to protect them. Now this case has been huge and there's bound to be things that I would have missed but if I was to go through the whole 2000 page discovery document I'd be here all day. But do leave you know any comments in the box below. But I can say that you know police did do an amazing job with the investigation allowing Shanann and her children to be put at rest quickly. Because of the Netflix documentary American Murder the Family Next Door interest in the case seems to be as strong now as when it happened in 2018. Now before we go I want to give a special mention to my superstar patrons and maybe you'd like to check it out and I'll leave the link below but basically if you sign up or level up to a certain tier now you will get a free signed copy of my next book when it publishes in April and you'll get entered in a draw to be uh, or name a character in a future book. But you must be a Patreon member for a minimum of three months. So now is a great time to join because my next book is out in April 2021. So huge thanks to this month's superstars, uh, Susanna Morass, Lisa S, Teresa Foley, and a special mention to Patreon supporter Caroline Thomas, who gave me some information on this case. And to you, thanks for watching. I don't mind admitting I had a few nightmares researching this case, but it is important not to dwell on it. Such cases are extremely rare, which is why they hit the news in a big way. And you know, if you did find value in this video, I'd hugely appreciate a subscribe and a like. <laughs> you can do that below. It really does help the channel. And I'll see you real soon. Bye bye for now.